Thanks for joining us. Uh, today we're going to tell you a little bit of a story uh, about how we've built an entirely serverless startup. Um, and uh, we're using a lot of this, you know, serverless technologies that we're all talking about to disrupt some traditional business models. We'll also share what we think are the core principles to follow when building serverless architectures. Um, but before we go any further, we'll probably introduce ourselves. So I'm Sam Kronenberg. I'm the CTO and one of the co-founders of an online learning platform called A Cloud Guru. We're also the founders and semi-organizers of Serverless Conf, although Ant and Christy <laughs> have done nearly all of the organization. Um, so look, we started building our serverless platform pretty much exactly one year ago from right now. Um, and we built it on top of Webtask.io. It's actually interesting listening to Joe because we, we use a lot of really similar technologies. Um, and then a few months later, we started using Lambda. And when API Gateway came out, we moved over to that stack. Um, you know, look, it's kind of weird, right? A, a year later, we're running serverless conf. We're here with the creators of Lambda and Webtask.io. Um, Tomash is here as well. Uh, so yeah, not really quite sure how that happened, but it's, it's amazing. <laughs> Um, look, our, our business, we train engineers all over the world on Amazon Web Services um, using on-demand video training on our platform. Um, as I said, that platform is entirely serverless, Lambda, API Gateway. In fact, we're a completely serverless company. So carrying on from the theme of Patrick and Joe about using services, we use services for SaaS services for everything. So we don't have any servers in our business at all. The only operating systems that we actually manage are the ones on our laptops. That's it. So we think that's kind of cool. Um, just very, very briefly about me. Prior to A Cloud Guru, I worked for Microsoft in both Seattle and in Norway. I was a developer on the Windows team in Seattle, and uh, I worked in the, files, the core file systems group. Um, there, my major focus was the disk defragmenter. Um, so I owned defrag, um, and in Windows 7, I had the honor of rewriting it from zero lines of code, which was awesome. Um, Usually I get a mixed reaction when I tell people that I wrote, <laughs> wrote defrag, but I did get to throw it out and start again. And I, uh, I was part of the team that took away the little visualization of all the blocks on your disk. Um, so most people don't <laughs> like me, but that decision <laughs> was made before I joined. So please don't shoot me. Um, so look, I guess the point, I also worked on fast search as well in Norway. And I guess the point of telling you that is I'm not anti-server. Um, I've actually spent a large portion of my career building server software like Windows Server. So this guy here with the, the amazing Bond villain accent is Pete. Thank you, Sam. Um, guys, these slides are very bright, so if I squint, please forgive me. Um, so yeah, like Sam said, my name is Pete Sbarski, and I'm VP of Engineering um, at A Cloud Guru. Look, my background is in computer science. I got my PhD in CompSci back in 2008. Um, I worked for the Defense Science and Technology Organization in Australia and the United, United Nations in New York. And over the past five years, I worked as a software development lead for a consultancy in Melbourne, Australia. Um, look, these days, my interest is cloud, um, software architecture, and the crazy, crazy world of web technologies. It is crazy. And yeah, look, I spend so much time on serverless these days. And it is amazing. It's revolutionary, and you guys will love it. Or you already you do. You already do. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll tell you a little bit about our story to kick this off and what we've built. So last year, uh, my brother Ryan, one of the other co-founders of A Cloud Guru, we put some courses on Udemy.com. Yeah. And uh, you know, they went a bit crazy. People loved them. People really seemed to love them. Um, and that was courses teaching people about AWS and helping them get their certifications. Um, so, you know, after a while we, we got together and we decided to build our own online training platform because we think learning is inherently a social thing and we had a vision to build kind of the online training resource for AWS and build the biggest AWS community in the world. In the last nine months since we launched that platform, we've scaled out to 55,000 engineers globally across 117 countries. At any given time, there are thousands of people using our platform simultaneously watching videos, doing quizzes, and interacting with each, with, with each other in real time while we have a whole discussion forum section that's integrated into the learning system. Our system is completely push-based and event-driven. That means as, as people interact, those interactions are pushed immediately out to all of the connected devices in the system to 
for people's desktops, smartphones, and tablets. And there's not one single piece of code in our system that sits and polls periodically waiting for a result or sits idling waiting for something to happen. We don't run any servers, as I've said, and our hosting bill is almost non-existent. And that's the thing I really like the most. Um, don't tell Tim. He's not here, oh, is he? Good. No, I think he's out there. <laughs> um, so to give you, I guess, a little more context of what we built, um, I'll show you a couple of screenshots. And I get the point here really is that this thing's not a toy, right? Like it's not building a serverless web application. It's not experimental. It's not something that's going to break. I mean, Joe's already shown you his. Um, but we'll show you what ours does. So users can come on, use our course viewer, and watch videos with our course viewer. They can do quizzes, practice exams. The site's totally responsive. It scales down nicely for smartphones and tablets with a lot of people using those devices. Um, it's got touch support, and we're working on a native app right now. And we run our own discussion forums, which are integrated into that platform. Like you can see there, it's Stack Overflow style. People can ask questions, answer, vote those answers up and down, and users build reputation. So why did we decide to build a serverless system. What, what were we thinking? The first thing for us was rapid time to market. And that was probably the, the original driver. So early on, we were resource constrained, right? We didn't have a big team. We were funding from cash flow. It was actually, it was, it was me. I took three weeks off work <laughs> and decided, let's try and build a, a training platform in three weeks. And then I had another week later. Um, so we did it in four weeks from scratch. And that's a platform that had everything that I just said. Um, you know, payments, sign up, authentication, video delivery, quizzes, and scalability. Because we knew, actually I'll get to scalability in a minute. And I really truly believe if I had taken, I was at the time I was a .NET developer. I did a lot of um, .NET web server stuff. And I truly, I know. It's OK. I know, yeah, it's, I know. It is tough. Um, and I really believe if we if we hadn't built it this way, so we've not there's no way I could have done it in four weeks, and we wouldn't we wouldn't have the business, we wouldn't have the training platform that we have. So that was number one. The next one was the ability to scale effortlessly. Like we knew at the time when we started, because we already had thousands of people taking these courses on Udemy, um, we knew it wasn't going to be we needed to scale fast, right? Like it wasn't going to be like a kind of slow trickle startup as people start to learn and we get time to change things and, and work on scalability. Um, and that, that happened to us. And, and we knew we were going to have to have large spikes um, during sale periods. Like we're a very sale focused business. There's, uh, Black Friday is, is huge for us. We launch a new course, we do a mail out, there's massive spikes. So we needed a technology that would scale effortless, effortlessly for us without intervention because we didn't have an ops team, right? It was just me. Um, and, and Lambda did that, really did that, and WebTask early on did that for us. But I think probably most importantly for us is the disruptive cost model. So we think that our model, our business model is tr disrupting the traditional training market. Instead of paying thousands of dollars for in-person training or even ongoing monthly fees, like a lot of online video training platforms will charge you $50 a month, $100 a month. Our customers pay $29 for a course once. It's a one-time purchase, and they never pay for that course again, but they have lifetime access. So we literally could not do that without Lambda, without AWS. Well, I should say, sorry, I should say, without serverless technologies. There are other, there are other yep. ones. So Lambda has enabled this because we only pay for the time that our code executes, right? So we don't have web servers hanging around, load balancers to pay for. CloudFront and S3 have enabled that because we only pay to deliver videos when our customers actually watch them, right? So no expensive media service. So think about what that means for us. We only pay when a customer actually uses our system and wants to do something of value to them. We only pay for a customer when they take a course, and customers take a course once, at most twice. So we don't actually need to charge ongoing fees. We have a few, of course, ongoing fees for some services like Auth0, but when you aggregate them over thousands of customers, it's very, very tiny. So in terms of actual hosting costs to AWS for the entire delivery of this platform, when we sell a course, it costs us about 12 cents to deliver it. So if the, if the customer watches it twice, we'll pay 24 cents. That's the kind of scale. 
So it literally has, this serverless approach has enabled our business model to be so cheap. And cool. uh, now we'll move on. Yep. Cool, let's swap. Awesome. So over, I guess, the course of building a Cloud Guru and trying to really understand this serverless thing, you know, serverless technologies, serverless architectures, we came up with our five principles that you see right there. And we'll kind of quickly go through these principles and what they are, and we'll illustrate with examples um, from our build of the platform. And it's kind of interesting listening to Tim this morning and listening to Joe just before. We kind of match on some things, and we don't match on others. It's, yeah, just yeah, keep in mind those other talks and see how they align to our principles. So let's have a look at them. So I guess, look, principle number one, and this is probably the most important principle there is, right? Run your code in a stateless compute service, like Lambda, right? Don't be silly, don't run or manage a server. Just don't do it, you'll be way better off. Um, look, your goal is usually to solve an interesting problem, right? It's not to patch Apache or something like that. So you can, run a, you can write a function to carry out almost any common task. Right, so you can read or write to a data source, you can call out to other functions, you can perform a calculation, it is all possible. And the other compelling thing about Lambda is that you only pay for the time that your code actually executes, right? So this means you are built in milliseconds. It massively reduces your hosting costs, like Sam has mentioned, because you don't have servers sitting there idling, costing you money, getting hot, um, you know, so in fact, I uh, probably shouldn't say this, but look, I'll say it. Due to the, you know, Lambda has a free tier, so we haven't actually, I think, ever paid for Lambda. No, we didn't. Don't tell those guys outside, seriously. We didn't, we'd never pay for yeah, Lambda. Yeah, we could be in yeah. trouble. Yeah. Probably shouldn't have said that, so <laughs> scratch that from the record. Um, look, obviously, there might be scenarios where a server is needed, right? So you need to run legacy software, you need to download something from an FTP server, and it takes 30 minutes to do so. Yeah, look, we get it. Um, but as a developer, you should, you know, try to avoid these use cases if you can and just, yeah, don't run a server. Yeah. Cool. So, and so here is a very, very basic use case um, of Lambda functions serving as a backend. And I think Tim showed something similar to this uh, this morning. So our client application, it could be a web app, it could be a mobile app, talks to our Lambda functions via the API gateway which is another service provided by AWS. Um, as far as the client is away, it is talking to a fully RESTful interface. Um, it doesn't know that there are Lambda functions behind this interface. It doesn't really need to know. It just works and scales. And so here's another, here's another example architecture. And we refer to this as compute as glue, right? So here, Lambda is used as glue between different services. Right? So in this example, we have a file stored in an S3 bucket, um, a relational database, a search service, an email sending service, um, push notification service, everything is integrated. And you connect everything together and glue everything um, using Lambda. So look, we might pop a file into an S3 bucket which causes um, a Lambda function to run. It might write some metadata to a database. It might fire off an email. Um, update the search index, do various things. And that's how we've structured um, our system, and it yeah. works beautifully well. Yeah, so we've used both those patterns. And I guess, look, speaking of compute services, we'd like to highlight, I guess, an interesting color corollary? Corollary, yep. Corollary <laughs> for you. <laughs> Should have chosen a different word. And this came out of a conversation, I, I spoke recently at the AWS summit with Ajay from the Lambda team, and I had a really interesting conversation with him. Um, and I think to me, it kind of this kind of highlights why we think serverless technologies are important, and why we think they're the next kind of paradigm for cloud compute. So, we think that serverless compute services like Lambda are as big a shift forward for cloud compute as S3 was for storage. And if you think about it, the two are actually really similar. So, Lambda is to compute what S3 is to storage. So S3 deals in objects for storage, right? Like you provide an object, S3 stores it. You don't know how, you don't know where, and you don't really care. There's no drives to concern yourself with in S3. There's no such thing as disk space. Not enough space, too much unused space, 
These concepts don't exist. All of that is abstracted away. You can't over-provision and you can't under-provision storage capacity in Lambda. It is just what you want it to be. So S3 will store and charge for you exactly what you give it, nothing more, nothing less. And S3 was a real game changer for, for cloud storage. Now let's think about Lambda. Lambda deals in functions for execution. So there's no such thing as server farm capacity, too many idling servers, not enough servers to meet demand, scaling groups, these concepts don't exist. All of that is abstracted away from you. You can't over-provision and you can't under-provision execution capacity in Lambda. It is just what you want it to be. So Lambda executes and charges you for exactly what you execute, nothing more, nothing less. And I think to me that's a really succinct, simple way of explaining why we think Lambda is the next level for cloud compute. And it's as big a shift forward for compute as S3 was for storage. Yeah. So our second principle, write single purpose stateless functions. Um, obviously, as software engineers, you guys are aware of the single responsibility principle. And you know that a function that is written to do one thing is more testable. It is usually more robust. It has fewer side effects. Mm -hmm. um, a granular function with a well-defined interface um, is also more likely to be re reused in a serverless architecture. So code written for a compute server, such as Lambda, should be written in a stateless, um, stateless, stateless style. So it must not assume that local resources or processes will survive beyond uh, the immediate session mm. with Nasris. Um, <laughs> I know Patrick had some issues. Um, statelessness is very powerful. It is actually the secret source to what makes compute services such as Lambda or OpenWhisk or Azure Functions possible because it allows the platform to scale very quickly to handle an ever-changing number of events or requests coming yeah. into the system. So it's often very hard to know where the granularity of a function actually is, right? Mm -hmm. Make something too granular, and then you have too many functions to manage. Ignore granularity completely, and you have created a mini monolith, which is a nightmare. It'll become a little monster yeah. in itself. So we have tried to kind of follow our principles and best judgment and write single-purpose stateless functions in our system. So each function has only one purpose. Um, and we'll give you just a couple of, a few examples of our functions. We have a lot of them, but we just hope to illustrate how we have kind of grouped our functions. Yeah. So we have a function that allows our users to submit a question or a comment on our forums. And we have one for uh, submitting answers as well, of course. Yep. Um, we allow people to upload things um, in our forums. Upload, yeah. Upload, upload, yeah. And that, that modifies the user's reputation, reputation as well. Yeah, that's always good. Um, we also have a function. This is my favorite Lambda function. We call him GuruBot. Um, GuruBot basically informs our instructors on the revenues that they've earned because we, we sell courses on behalf of our instructors. So GuruBot will, uh, they, can, they can talk to him from Slack. And they can call, or call through API Gateway, call out to GuruBot. GuruBot will work out, you know, you can say, how much did I earn today? How much did I earn this month? How much money do you owe me? Um, but he also runs on a schedule as well. He's a scheduled Lambda function, and once a day, and once a month, he, he both slacks and emails reports out to all of our... Yeah, um, it's an awesome little bot. Yeah, we just favorite. need to connect him to an echo, so we can say, Guru bot, how much did I earn? Money. Money, yeah. awesome. <laughs> um, we have another function that takes payment when a user, uh, when a user buys a new course. Um, and we also, like, you know, we, we deliver videos, right, that people pay for, but we need to deliver them via a CDN, but they need to be secured. You can't get to them if you, if you haven't paid for them, but they need to be on a public CDN. So we distribute via CloudFront, um, but what we do is we generate signed URLs for CloudFront. So they're signed um, with a secret key in the URL, and they have an expiry, and we use a Lambda function to do that. So our front end calls through to Lambda to say, hey, here I am, I've paid for this course, and we check that in Lambda and we generate a signed URL that says, okay, this person has access to issue a GET request to load this video in their browser for the next three hours. Yep. yep. Cool. So our third principle, um, when you work with serverless architectures, try to design push-based event-driven pipelines, mm. right? Um, they are powerful. They allow you to extend architectures very simply, and they look like magic when they work. Um, so an event-driven pipeline is basically one that kicks off um, thanks to an event. 
and then continues to propagate further without any additional user input. So one event triggers another event um, in a chain reaction, I guess. So for example, here is our video transcoding pipeline. Obviously, this is, this is, this is simplified. This is not the full pipeline. Um, but we just wanted to illustrate what it looks like from a high level. So we allow our lecturers who create courses for us to upload videos. These videos get transcoded to a number of different formats that then our users can play back. So here's what happens. Um, say, let's say I want to upload a file. I actually issue a request to a Lambda function, which is shown here, um, to get the right credentials, which then allow me to upload straight to an S3 bucket. So there are no servers, it's all serverless. So then I can upload to an S3 bucket. That event, that upload, or creation of a new file in a bucket, kicks off a Lambda function, which creates an Elastic Transcoder job. So Elastic Transcoder is an AWS managed services which does the actual video encoding. Yeah. So we create a job, we create maybe 10 different transcodings for 1080p, 720p, 480p, HLS, um, WebM, WebM, all kinds of different formats. This all happens, and then Elastic Transcoder dumps those files into another bucket. That pushes a message onto an SNS topic, which is wired to a number of other Lambda functions, which fan out. And one of those functions is connected to our user-facing database, which is Firebase. So this is what Joe is using as well. And so that Lambda function updates Firebase. And because Firebase is a real-time streaming database that uses WebSockets, all users see that update automatically. So it's quite amazing. It's, you basically do something, yeah. and then you see an update happen without any polling um, so think about or refreshing. It's browser to browser push. Like the initial upload is from a user's browser straight to S3. And that might be a 100 mega or a gigabyte file. Yeah. And the yeah. entire thing is push based right back to all of the connected users' browsers. Yeah, yeah. and it scales and it works very well. All right. Mm. Cool, so this is number four, and this is very much in line with what Joe's been talking about. Um, so this is to create thicker and more powerful front ends. Um, if you think about your traditional three-tier approach to software architecture, um, you've got the browser, loosely you've got your presentation tier in the browser, you've got your web server hosting your logic tier, and you've got your database with your data tier. And we did that for a long time, right, because it gives you that nice separation of concerns. But I think the problem, it, this has been exacerbated by single page application frameworks. They've come out and now we've got these really rich frameworks in the front end. So in a single page app, you've now got your whole MVC framework in the browser. It's got views, controllers, services. These services have to talk over the wire to your server, uh, which then has its own layering. It's got, you know, you've got the communication contract, obviously the API to go over the wire. Um, which you've got to define and maintain. You've then got to maintain all the layering in your server. So you've got your incoming DTO. You've got to bind that to a model. You've got to do validation. You've then got to go talk to your database, get a model out of there. Um, oh, that's too then, much work. I'm oh, just tired of listening to that. Yeah, God, it, it actually hurts to say yeah. it. Um, and if you want to add a new feature to your product, you've got to touch every layer through that stack. And in previous jobs that Pete and I have had, we've, we've seen, you know, Multi I'm sure you've all seen it, multiple service layers, like 15 layers yeah, easy. to modify one feature. At a text box. Feature. It's yep. just crazy. I'll see you in three weeks. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so with the explosion, so this is our, this is loosely our architecture, right? So you've got all these web-based services that everyone's been talking about this afternoon. And you've also got these awesome security mechanisms now like cores, JSON web tokens, SAML, so something new becomes possible. So now your front-end app can talk to all of these cloud services directly. So we use Auth0 as well. Um, we use Firebase. Um, we talk users submit their credit card details directly to Stripe. We use Intercom for customer messaging and customer analytics. We use Segment for analytics that pushes off to a Redshift database. That all happens serverless without us. And then we have a full data warehouse that we don't have to set up or manage. It's just there for us. Um, now in this model, it's possible to remove the middleman, right? Um, and so see, I guess, look, see, the client application's a whole lot smarter here, right? So it talks directly to Auth0 to do the authentication and to get access credentials. Um, from there, it can use those credentials to talk to all the other services. So Auth0 can give you a delegation token to talk to Firebase. It's pretty awesome. Um, and any custom code that you do need to run, 
in a cloud, your web service can still talk directly to your cloud functions to perform those very targeted and very specific functions. But I think to Joe's point, this footprint of code running in the cloud actually becomes really, really small. It's actually really tiny. Um, and 95% of our code um, actually sits in the front end. So now when you want to add that new feature, in a lot of cases, you can just touch the stack in your front end and just call straight out to a powerful service like Firebase, even to write data. So you can touch a, few, a lot less services. And this leads us to our final principle. You know, try to use third-party services. Mm -hmm. There are companies that dedicate 100% of their resources to doing some of these things very well. Yeah. Right? So you have Op0 for authentication and login. Right? You have S3 for file storage. You have CloudFront for CDN distribution. Mm -hmm. You have Firebase for data. You have Stripe and Braintree for payments. Yeah. And each of these companies do, this, do they think very well, right? Yeah. So you can pick up a lot of speed and you can move very fast by outsourcing, outsourcing everything that isn't your core product, yeah. right? It doesn't work in all cases, but when it does, it works very well. Also, I want to say we didn't yeah. include it here, but we also use Netlify as and well. Netlify. And it is awesome service. Yeah, absolutely. So try to leverage this, yeah. these services if you can, right? Um, and focus your energy on developing what actually makes your product unique. Okay, so what's next for us? Just to wrap this up, where are we, we going to go from here? We're serverless. What do we do next? We actually want to migrate to completely immutable architectures, immutable serverless architectures. And it was really nice to hear Tim this morning talking about, what was the name of the service? Flourish. Sorry? Flourish. 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 Because it sounds like they're going to support exactly this, but I haven't asked him yet. So. Um, so in distributed systems, versioning is, is painful, right? You've got multiple components all cooperating in some kind of event-driven pipeline. Um, and it's, it's hard to upgrade components in that pipeline because they depend on each other. So you might have work that's halfway through the flow. You might have messages in SNS topics, for example, that are still being processed. Um, and now if you suddenly go and change some pieces, some Lambda function there because you're upgrading the system, some pieces of the flow have changed unexpectedly, and they're not as you originally designed them to be. So our plan is we really want to recreate our entire production compute and messaging environment on every single deployment in a completely automated fashion. So the API gateway, the Lambda functions, SNS topics, S3 buckets, everything. So that means you can now leave your current production environment untouched while you deploy the new one. Once you're ready, you can simply switch over to a new version with a simple change to the API, um, routing all new incoming requests to the new Lambda functions and the new pipelines. But it also allows you to keep the previous production environment running to complete its work. So Lambda functions can continue to work on all the messages and the SNS topics until they're drained, until they're finished. Once everything's finished, you, you might actually keep it there because you might have a versioned API, or you might just um, throw it away delete it with a scheduled Lambda function. We don't know. We haven't worked it out yet. Yeah. Maybe Flourish will do it all for us. Maybe it will. Um, and yeah, also obviously allows you to do a simple rollback um, to a previous working system in the event of a failure. That's kind of where we want to go next. Yeah, cool. So look, um, we will be publishing all the videos from serverlessconf um, online. Um, on and the iCloud Guru platform? On the iCloud Guru platform, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and we will also be releasing an online course um, on serverless, uh, on building serverless application, applications based on our experience. Yep. Um, so, yeah, watch our Twitter feed at iCloud Guru. Please subscribe. Yeah.